if uh, I can ask if you guys would turn to the book of Nehemiah. And uh, we're going to read in chapter 2 from verses 4 to 11. Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Amen. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm going to worship. Yes, I am. We praise you right now. We praise you right now. Thank you all. Just, just really needed to worship right now. Just, just, just a time right now, a season in my life where God has just really just put a burden on my heart. And I know that in the midst, he still wants me to preach today. But at the same time, this is, this is what he gave to me. And I um, just want to just worship the Lord today. And I'm thankful for what he's given me to preach to you all today. And I just want to just worship him right now as, as he's giving me the word to give to you. Uh, let's continue. We're going to continue in, the, in Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, last time we talked, uh, we talked about overcoming fear through faith in Nehemiah chapter 2. We realized that he, he had to go before the king and face the fact that, that he was sad. He was sad to the point that he realized that he could have he faced death. Over a period of four months that he prayed and he fasted and he wept from hearing the report of the, the, the Jews back in Jerusalem. Mind you, Hananiah was his, bro his, his blood brother who gave him the information about the report in Jerusalem. So just recapping from what we, we talked about last time, and we know that God answered his prayers, that he softened in his hearts. That he, that he went before him to get the, to get the tools, to get all that he needed to, to head to Jerusalem for the building project. And as, as Brother LaShawn read, uh, it came to the time where we get in verse 10, even though that he had everything he needed, the queen was sitting right next to the king on Persian stone, which God still gave him you know, favor in the midst of him sitting, her sitting on that throne. We get the verse 10 where it says, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tob Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Me, the, en the enemy tried to attack him for doing what God had called him to do. Now, it's been a period of time between Nehemiah traveling from where he was at in, in Persia until he got to Jerusalem for a period, it says, for 
another two months. Mind you, he was already fasting and praying for four months. Now he had to walk, you know, with the, the army, the camp, those who was with them, lead them to, to go to Jerusalem for two more, two more months. As we get to the text, it says in verse 11, when I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, notice nothing else is said. Silence. So I was going to just stop right there, just in the midst of the silence in our life. As I titled this, is, this sermon as well, we know that Nehemiah is getting ready to go to, to do the inspection of the Jerusalem walls. He's now there, but now he's at a point of silence. Where are we with the silence in our life? When God is not speaking, or he's not, you feel as if he's not showing up, or maybe it's, is this a season in your life where you're just not really hearing God, or maybe he's really speaking to you, but you're just a time of silence. So, just want to title the title of the sermon is the basic essentials of godly leadership from the life of Nehemiah and today's sermon is titled the great inspection in the life of the believer the great inspection in the life of the believer so notice we come to the point of silence I want to look at the first point where it says leaders leaders must assess the conditions in their own lives before leading others Leaders must assess the conditions in their own lives before leading others. Look at letter A. It says, Nehemiah took the time to rest in the Lord in solitude until God told him what to do next. As leaders, we must understand the importance of rest and solitude in the Lord as he leads us. It was crazy as I was studying this text. It's, as, it, as it reads in the New King James Bible, it says that, so I went to the city of Jerusalem and stayed there three days, period. Wait a minute. So what actually happened? You know, it didn't say Nehemiah prayed, he fasted, he thought about the facts, he thought about, you know, the condition of the people. You know, his heart was burning for uh, Jerusalem. It didn't say anything else but, period, silence. And... As all of us, we would want to find, we would want to know, like, okay, what actually happened during that time that Nehemiah was in Jerusalem for those three periods? Um, the guy was giving me something. He was showing me, as it says in letter A, it says, Nehemiah took the time to rest in the Lord in solitude until God told him what to do next. <laughs> as leaders, we must understand the importance of rest and solitude in the Lord as he leads us. What Nehemiah was doing was showing us a demonstration of how we should rest in the Lord in solitude and prayer before we can know what's next in our life. See, sometimes we have to realize that we can't just focus on what we want to do and move forward. You know, I realized as a football player, I had this tunnel vision, and I just thought about this. And in, when you're in the game, as a wide receiver, you always focus on the next play. You know, focusing on getting that catch, catch, tuck, turn, running, getting into the end zone. And that was just my focus. My tunnel vision was to win the game. But as the offense or defense has in itself, they have a huddle in which we always must go back to the huddle because we realize that's where we get rest, that's where we get the play, that's where we get the direction, and that's what we know what's to do next. But think about it, if we didn't have no huddle to go back into, if we just played in the game, the defense didn't listen to their coaches or I didn't listen to my coaches, then I wouldn't have no sense of direction of what I'm supposed to do next. The game would be chaotic. You know, they would just be players hitting each other or whatever. It's kind of like that football game you know, that they used to play, what they call blitz. You know, they're just all over the field, just hitting each other, beating each other up. See, there's no rules and no regulations of what we need to do. But see, God is trying to give us direction to the point where he wants us to show us what's next. And that's why we should come and rest. And that's why we should come in solitude so we can know what God has next for us. <coughs> Amen. Amen. And see, Nehemiah taught us this in the text. And if you, if you go, turn with me real quick, you turn to Mark, Mark chapter 6, verse 31. 
not only did Nehemiah show us a demonstration of what it means to rest and, and um, in solitude of the Lord, Jesus is our great example of rest and solitude in the Lord. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 6, verse 31, we're going to look at verses 31 through 32. Just a recap, it just, it's just uh, the time where they just fed the 5,000 people and then they were trying to get away and they go into solitude. And the people just kept coming up to them, hey, you know, just ask them to do more. But if we, re if we look at the text, verse 31, is everybody there? Amen. It says that the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to them all they had done and taught. You know, all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat in solitude. But also added verse 33. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. I think about that in the context of the church or ministers or the pastor. I'm thankful that we that we brothers got together and allowed our pastor to rest and take time, you know, to really service the solitude and the prayer time with the Lord because rest is needed because rest is the time where God can actually show us what he wants he can just pour into us and give us our rest and give us everything that we need to move forth to him and Jesus was demonstrating this with the apostles because they're doing the ministry they're doing the work that God has called them to do but they they must realize that the most important thing is resting in the Lord we must realize the most important thing in our life is to first rest in the Lord, spending time in prayer, reading our Bible, you know, getting all that we need from him so we can know what to do to move, move next. Amen. Amen. Because we realize that, that folk always going to be coming and going as we see they still followed him and go, but went directly to where they were going next. But just that little bit of time of solitude that they had allowed them to rest in the Lord. We must remember to focus on that. Look at that point B real quick. Well, let me not skip this. Look at, let's look at Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 26. I just want to make a point real quick. Um, Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 26 and 28. Verse 26, it reads, It was good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. See, we must rest also because we must realize that this work that we do is burdensome. You know, we should cast our cares upon him for he cares. We should cares, cast his burdens on him. But we, we have burdens that we, that we have as well. You know, think about it in the context. God was showing me in the context of my family, my job, school. All this week, God laid these burdens upon me. But I realized that he gave me the strength to get through. You know, I had last week of class, I had to finish some papers, write two papers, long papers, take two tests. Mind you, I had to, had to uh, prepare for uh, the, my first big event at my job where we had a youth fund day. So all the particulars, and I was, I was the head person. So everybody came to me, David, 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 David. You know, just the burden of all the people. And at the same time, just in the midst of that, just hearing uh, my brother was wanting to commit suicide, my, my youngest brother. And just hearing the thoughts of that, it's burning my heart. And not only that, just hearing my mother got into a car wreck. Um, car was total, but thank God that he spared her life. No injury, no brain damage. Thankful that uh, she got a new company truck that week because the one that she had might have cost her life, but God spared her. The burden. And as a young man, we must, it says, 
as you are young to carry that burden because I realize this work is going to continue to be a burden, but at the same time, you must give it to the Lord. You must rest in him because he can give us that strength. He can carry us through. See, God carried me through that I can preach to you today. Amen. That's why I stand before you, burden, but at the same time, for the people. For the people. Amen. 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 Help me, Lord. Look at point B. It says, Nehemiah carefully and cautiously set out to Jerusalem's wall with the help of a few men. God will sometimes place others in our lives to hold us accountable and to help us work, to help us in the work he has planned for us. <clears throat> Verse 12, it said, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. See, notice, notice that in the text, uh, verse 12, we see that, so I set out to Jerusalem for three days, period. Nothing, silence, no answer. Nothing else was discussed. But we see now Nehemiah moving forth what God had told him to do. He said, so I set out with a few other men. So God told him to take another man with you. Take your mount with you, your donkey, which is, which is referring to a donkey or animal in the text to go before you, and not only that, he said go out at night. You see how, how carefully and cautiously God gave him that information of how he needed to go out to inspect those walls. See, this is, this is what God is actually <laughs> trying to get us to do. See, there may be a few others in our life that God wants us to come alongside with uh, maybe talk about the facts about, you know, maybe starting a church or maybe it's just starting a new ministry or, or whatever it may be in your life about this or maybe some discernment of what you may need. See, God put other people in your life for the purpose of helping you to see what's next in your life. So you must recognize that this is Nehemiah got all the facts from God by resting in solitude. See, solitude is so important. There's, there's no way that I can stand before you today and preach and teach and do this ministry of the work of the Lord if I don't come before the Lord's seat. It, and also, you got to think about the context of Nehemiah. He's a cupbearer to the king. Let's go back to that. He's a cupbearer to the king. For, for 20 years, he's serving. He's ministering, ministering food, ministering wine to the king. But now it's come to a point where now he's not just focused on the daily routine of his, or what he usually do. He's now to the point where he has to focus on what God is telling him to do. See, sometimes we're so used to doing our jobs or things at home, but God wants to bring about change so that way he can bring that change for his good in our life. So for 20 years now, Nehemiah had to face the fact that now each and every day, he had to come before the Lord and get the facts from him and how he needed to move forth in faith. Amen. 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 See, God knows exactly what he has planned for us. We must just continue to trust in him. See, this, this is, and what I said in, in the beginning, it says the leaders assessments to conditions in our own lives before leading others. See, we must assess our own lives first as leaders to see, you know, what we need to do better, and not, not just better, but what we need to do for God. And there was two questions the Lord just gave me right now. So what do we need to do better for the Lord? What can I do for you? And how can I serve others? How can I serve others? And see, and it's crazy how I was just sitting, sitting in silence. So I was just, one day I was in my, my house, just sitting on the couch. And with all these burdens that was going upon in my life, I just sat down in silence. Like, I don't know what else to do. Like, this is out of my control. Like, how can I handle this? You know, still issues with my son, too. Not, mind you, it's like, oh, my God, what is overwhelming? <laughs> But I trust you. Lord, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. I'm just sitting in silence like, Lord, what's next? Lord, I need you to help. You know, I feel like, I feel like Nehemiah because my family's in Texas. You know, I'm hearing the report. I'm texting my sister. It's like, what's going on? See, God, and, I'm, and, and some of you might think, why did he skip chapter one of Nehemiah? Why did he start in chapter two? God was saying, well, 
I see you all have genuine concern for his people. You have a heart for him. You mourn for people. You weep for people. You know the word. But now I want to get you to the point where I need to break that ice. See, I think he kind of broke that ice in me. You know, I was kind of fearful. But now I can stand up and feel comfortable because I'm, I'm in peace with him because I know that he's, he's, he's called me to this. So, and, and that's what it is. Now we need to take that step further to see what's next. The ice is broken, but now let's get to the, let's cut the chase. We must assess our lives so we can lead up. Amen. 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 So now that the ice is broken, let's look at point two. It says leaders must inspect and see the ruin in their own lives before leading others. Leaders must inspect and see the ruin in their own lives before leading others. So we, we see in the text that Nehemiah went out with his view. Man, now we get to, now we get to uh, verse 13. It says, by night I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Look at point A. It says, as leaders, this is all of us, as leaders, we must continue to lead in humility with total dependence on the Lord. We must continue to lead in humility with total dependence on the Lord. One point I want to realize that, I want you guys to realize is that the walls of Jerusalem already have been built. That, that's already been taken care of. See, God wants to build our lives, the walls in our lives, so we can realize we need to be, continue to be reconstructed so we can continue to be more and more like him. See, let's get the fact that I understand it's the walls, but the walls are our lives. We need to build up in our lives so we can, we can be all we can be in Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 I just wanted to put that out there. But let's look at it said, as leaders, we must continue to lead in humility with total dependence on the Lord. See, the valley gate, the valley gate was a significant point of humility in the Lord. It's, it's how we come before the Lord, how we bow before him, how we come before him. It's, it's kind of like the point where it's when we first got saved. Humility, how we had to come before him. The life that we lived before him. As he read in the, uh, in the response to as for some of you, put your name there. David, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions. As you used to walk away according to the desires of the what? The flesh. Put your name there. That's what we used to do. But we had to come in humility before God. And we must constantly be reminded that as leaders, we must continue to lead in humility with total dependence on the Lord. See, we can't just go about and doing this work of the Lord in our own strength. That'll be chaotic. That'll be a disaster. That'll be a disaster. We must be in total dependence on the Lord. You look at you don't have to turn there. I'm not going to read it. It says Proverbs 3, 4. We, we know what the text says. Um, anyway, I don't know what it says. <laughs> we give grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble, but he oppresses the proud. We know that text. See, God gives grace to the humble, but he oppresses the proud. See, we walk in our own, in our own way. He would oppress everything that we want to do. You know? So this is a constant reminder how we should return to him, to that gate, that gate of humility, so that we can focus on him. Amen? See, this is how we should lead as followers of Christ. We look at point B. It says, as leaders, we must continually continue to purify ourselves daily from the contamination of sin. Amen. As leaders, we must continue to purify ourselves daily from the contamination of sin. Look at verse uh, verse 13. It says, By night I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and done Examining walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and his gates, which had 
been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on. I'm sorry, it's in the same chapter. By night I went out through the valley gate, the jack of well, and the dung gate. The dung gate. See, the dung gate is the next gate that was a more uh, important emphasis of which God was trying to show me in mind as well. Now, the dung gate, which which means that we should empty out, we should eliminate. Uh, it's a picture of um, us eliminating the sin in our life into the valley of what they call the henna, or we know in the New Testament it's called the Gehenna, which is really referred to hell, referred to as hell. In the Old Testament, we know the God of Molech sacrificed their, their sons to you know the God of Molech. And this is just a picture of how we should continue just to purify our lives from the life of sin. See, sin can contaminate us to the point where we can't move forth in Him. And notice I said also that we should purify ourselves daily from the contamination of sin. Luke 9 tells us, take up our cross daily, daily, and follow Him. Because sin can, can blind us. Sin can keep us from moving forth in what we need to do. See, it can get to the point where it can build up. And if we look at the next verse, it says, Then I moved, toward, then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for them out to get through. See, there was no room for them out to get through. See, there's a picture right here of a big wall of rubbish, a big wall of rocks that was piled up to the point where Nehemiah could not get through with the animal that he was riding on. He couldn't get through. So he had to, he had to get off this mountain, get off his animal, and walk through the valley so that he could get a, a clear picture of the inspection of what God wanted him to do. See, not only that we should, as leaders, we should purify ourselves from the daily sins of the contamination of sin in our lives. We must continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit as, God's lead, as we lead God's people. As we lead God's people. See, the fountain gate is a representation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in our lives, working, teaching giving us all things that we need for the work of the king. But realize, notice that it said that he couldn't get around. He had to get off his mount, and he had to walk around all the rubbish, all the stones, all the, all the, 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 the demonstration, the demolishing of the walls and all the, all the buildup that it had. See, that's what sin does. Sin can build up to the point where it stops the flowing of the Holy Spirit in our life to move and to govern us and to be really filled by him. See, this is why we have to continue to, to release it, to empty it, the dung gave me to, to, to release that to him so that we can continue to be filled and lead others. See, that inspection he had to do, he had to take a close inspection on that. You see that he had to go around the mountain and the rocks because he had to get a closer inspection on his own life, the sin in his own life, Amen. before he can lead others. Well, Matthew 7 tells us, don't look at the speck in your brother's eye without, what, looking at the, the two by four in your own eye, right? <laughs> you over here, you know, fornicating and adultery and doing all these things, but you trying to help a brother, but you doing the same thing. Take the log out of your eye, brother. Amen? Amen. See, we have to get a closer inspection on our own life of the sin, the rut, all the garbage, all that it is that's in our life that's keeping us from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because not only that, the Holy Spirit is the will of God, as we know in um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. He said, do not be foolish, knowing what the will of God is, right? But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me go back. But do not be drunk on wine that leads to what? Debauchery. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So you can't be, we can't be contaminated with the things of these worlds, the lust of the eyes, love of the flesh, the pride of life, because that can contaminate us to the point where we're not being filled with the Holy Spirit. See, we have to be filled so we can help other brothers come along. Because at the end of Matthew 7, so that when you take the, the law out your own eye, then you can take the speck out of somebody else's eye. So that's how we can help others. Amen? Amen. See, that's how we should lead. Amen? So as, as the body of Christ, that's how we should move forward in our lives as we expect the ruin in our own lives. And see, God gave me this too as well. He said that, see, all of us are ruined. All of us are, all of us are what? Sinners. Saved by grace. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. See, all of us are ruined. <laughs> but we're not ruined. Amen. Amen. We're ruined, but we're not ruined because we have Christ. And see, Amen. since we're not ruined, we can move forth and help another brother or somebody else come to faith because what we have. Amen. And see, and God was telling me this testimony that I have, but at the same time, we shouldn't be ashamed of the testimony that we have before the life that we live with Christ. See, I was ashamed. I, I'm thankful for a brother who shared his testimony on Facebook, not knowing what I was going through, but exactly what I needed to hear, yeah. just, just to be comfortable with myself to not be ashamed of the life that I live and yeah. thinking that what I wanted was what I needed and it was not the right thing, but God was showing me that this is somebody else need to hear this as well. Yeah. You know, being an athlete, being a football player, fornicating, all that I did, sex, drugs, all that it was to the point, I realized that I was just so embarrassed to the point, but God said that's a demonstration of the work that I did in your life, David. Yeah. Amen. So I thank God for that. After you, this is, this is what you were, but you were washed, you were yeah. clean. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let's not, let's not real, let us not forget where we came from. You see, the very struggle, the testimony that you have will be the same thing to help somebody else come through their life. Amen. See, a lot of stuff that's happening in this world today, we're facing, we have that, that testimony, but we're afraid to share it. Don't be afraid to share what God has put in your life, the ruin in your life, to help other people be, not be ruined. Amen. Amen. But at the same time, she said, point D, said, as leaders, we must continue to help others come to, and return to the Lord. Come and return to the Lord. Verse 15, it says, So I went to the valley gate by night, examining the walls. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. So I went up to the valley by night, returning into the wall. So we... We're back to the point where you have this rock. This rock is about 15 foot high. So you know, 15 foot high, no animals getting through there. So maybe the crease was just, just enough so he can just get through. You know. But the valley is right here. So you have to just get a close, you no, know, it's nighttime. So you had to get a closer picture of what he needed to see in his own life so that way he can lead others and, or come to return to the Lord. Yeah. But we see that this valley, see this valley is, is called the, the Kedron Valley. And a lot of times in the text we know in the Old Testament is referred to the, the brook or the Keaton Valley, but there's a point that I wanted to, to, to let you guys know. This same valley that is, is mentioned right here on the east side of this valley, it was where many of our um, contemporaries died or was buried on the, on the east side of this valley. So it's, it's a point that, where they were buried. So it's a symptom of death, the death that happened. So it's a passing of death. Um, it's also referred to sadness. Um, a period of time of darkness. So this, this is what this, this valley means. But what's significant about this, this same valley, the Kedron Valley that they had to cross over, Jesus crossed over before he went to the cross. Before he went to the cross. This is so powerful. I was like, oh, wow, God, this is you. And I was like, <laughs> if we can look, if you can just, uh, no, nah, you don't have to look. In John chapter 18, verse 1, it says, When he had finished praying, Jesus left the disciple and crossed the Kedron the Kid Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he was with his disciple, went into it. Now, so he had to cross over to the other side of the garden, and we know who was on the other side of the garden. It was Judas, who actually betrayed him, who got him arrested. But notice the picture of what God was actually trying to demonstrate, still giving him an opportunity to come, to return to him. See, he crossed over that darkness, crossed over that valley, because it's Christ in itself. There's no sin in him. There was nothing to mention in him. See, he crossed over that valley to show that he can overcome death. 
He can overcome the darkness. He can overcome anything in our life to the point where we can depend on him so we can return to him. You see, Judas, what did he do? He didn't believe. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't come to, to realize that the time that he was with the Father, eating with him, dining with him, he still didn't believe. And this is a beautiful picture of, of Christ going before us to cross over that Kidron, Kidron Valley so that way we can know that the death is overcome by him. The darkness, the depression, every sin that was actually crossed over, God delivered us from them. And see, and since we have that, we must help others return to him. Notice in the text it said, then I returned to the valley gate. See, he realized that he needed to return where he first got humbled. When he first got saved, he continued fire for the Lord. See, sometimes we, we have this desire and longing when we first get saved, but then we just lose that when we just get into the regular routines of life and just the mess and all that it is. We must continue just to return to him yeah. daily and merely and depending on him because that's what it's all about. And see, we can help others return to him as well. Yeah. Who, who, who's in that darkness? Who's in the, that deep sin or whatever it is? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's look at point three where it says, leaders must encourage and challenge others to do the work of the Lord. Point A, it says, Nehemiah identified with the needs of the people, shared his vision, and encouraged the people to rise up to build for the kingdom of God. Look at verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruin, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. It said, Nehemiah identified with the needs of the people, shared the vision, and encouraged the people to rise up to build for the kingdom of God. See, DMI got a closer pitch, closer picture of the walls of Jerusalem. He heard the report. Now he's just there. He's inspecting it. It's like a, a medical term where he's just, he's probing it. He's getting right closer within what he needs to see. See, he's, he's, he's visualizing that. He's seeing what they see. Now he's identifying with the needs of the people. Because in the text, we realize that he says, we, us, we. You no, know, it's not about just me, it's about we, us. We helping each other so that we can move forth in him. Amen. See, this vision that he had wasn't his own vision, but this came from God. And it, it coming from God, Nehemiah was able to share this because of the sense that he had the time before, you know, when he was facing the king, we realized he gave him all that he needed. You know, all the materials, all the letters. He gave him everything that he needed before he went to Jerusalem. See, he was focusing on that success that he had back then. See, we must continue to focus on what God did before that he will do it again. We shouldn't be worried about, you know, what um, Mike about to lose his wife, about to lose his job, but the strike about to hit. We've been here before. God, if you've done it before, you can do it again. Sorry, babe, I didn't know. But at the same time, just want to encourage people to know that God already showed his favor and hand upon us. Even in the midst of we knowing that the strike was coming, all the teachers got together, donated time, donated hours, so that she can have maternity leave, so that way all our needs will be met. God is faithful. Yes. It's the time of us coming to him in silence and rest that he allowed this to happen. And her just telling me that I'm, as I'm at home, I'm off, 
typing my papers, dealing, dealing with all these birds, right? <laughs> I had to stop in silence and say, wow. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'd rather praise you than write this paper. <laughs> and you just texting me back, oh, God is so good. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. I'd rather, you know, praise you than, than deal with the circumstance. But at the, at the same time, God was showing us how favorable he is, how his hand was upon us to let him know that he, got, he has our child. This is as he had our hand upon you. He has you in his hand. Whatever circumstance it seems to the point where it is overwhelming. God has you. He can grant you success, as he told these other brothers. I want to wrap it up. Let's get to point B. Point B, it says, God moved the people through Nehemiah to start rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem because the gracious hand of God was upon him. I just shared that. Point C, it says, Nehemiah's enemy ridiculed him from starting the rebuilding project, but he continued to trust his God to give him success. Amen. Let's look at verse 19. It says, But when, Neh, when, when, but when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah and the Ammonite official, and Geshem the, the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Are you rebelling against the king? See, Nehemiah already spent experiences in, in verse 10 where it said, And Sanballat and all, all of them came together to, they were discouraged. But now we see that they asked the question, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you trying to build the walls of Jerusalem? Who gave you permission? Who gave you permission? And just like with us, people might ask you, who you think you are? <laughs> why, why, why are you a follower of Christ? Why are you a follower of Christ Jesus? And, and, you know, constantly go to church every Sunday, read your Bible all the time, you know, telling others about Jesus and, you know, praying for other people and trusting him who's, un who's invisible, who's unseen. Why, why are you? See, it, it was a point where it says that they ridiculed. And then the King James said it, they laughed at him with scorn. So it's kind of like, <laughs> are you crazy? What are you doing? So it's kind of like, and, and that's what people do. And see, when we do the work for the Lord, people are going to ridicule us just like they did with Jesus. They ridicule him, they spit on him. But we must continue to realize that just like Nehemiah, we must continue to trust in him. He'll give us that success. Because the next thing you realize in the text, it says, Verse 20, it said, I answered them by, by saying, the God of heavens will give me success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim of historical right to it. I want to end with this. It says, letter D, we must be reminded that, that our enemies have no share in the worship to our Lord. They have no share. They have no share in the worship of our Lord. So you must continue to trust God and move forward. You know, I'm thinking about the building project here. We must continue to move forward. God's already shown us the vision that our pastor has. God's already shown us that we have a love, such a love for him. But we must move forth in him. The opposition is coming. Ridicule is here. We must trust him and move forth in him. Because he'll give us success. Amen. He'll give us success. Amen. We must realize that Satan has no part in our worship. He can't worship with us. The historical right, no memorial meaning that we already know the beginning from the end. We know he's going to be blue away, right? Amen. We already know. We already knew. So we must continue to move forth and build and encourage others to move forth in the work of the kingdom. You see, because your gift is important to me too. I see what my gift is. My gift is to encourage you, to strengthen you, just as Paul says, with all strength, with the, all the energies of Christ that works within me. So I had to work this week, strenuously. I didn't get no sleep. I had to work. Because you needed a word. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Now, also, he says, with all the afflictions of Christ that dwells within me, the afflictions that I have for the sake of what's happening in my life, what I will love, because I'm burdened, I realize these people need Christ. Amen. We have a genuine heart. We have a concern for our people. We mourn for our people. Now let's get up and build for the kingdom. Amen. Let us build for the kingdom. Realize that your gift is important, whether it's service, whether it's you know, feeding the hungry, whatever it is, you are important. We need you. I need your encouragement. We need your encouragement. Amen. 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 I want to close with it. it says, Nehemiah's great inspection and encouragement to the Jews moved them to start the rebuilding of the Jerusalem wall. Like Nehemiah, will you rise up and build for the kingdom? Will you rise up? Will you rise up for the kingdom? Will you rise up?